On Friday, if you look ahead in your in your booklets, we're having a panel discussion. Now, you guys have already given us the questions that you wanted asked. Well, the panel here of four different pastors, and they will be discussing the questions that you submitted. However, you guys asked a lot of questions, and this panel isn't going to be able to answer all of these questions. So some of them I saved for a smarter group of people. So I'm not going to tell you who these guys are. You're going to have to figure it out. But I, I would like my distinguished panel to come forth and take your seats. Let's hear it for the panel. Now, as we discuss some of these issues, I am going to ask for a little bit of maturity. Because some of these issues are, well, controversial. Okay? I don't want any fight. I don't want any screaming. Oh, I disagree. Okay, if you disagree, that's fine. But, you okay? Okay. Well, let's, let's jump into our, are you ready for our discussion? Now, these are the questions that were too controversial for our Friday panel. So you guys are not getting easy questions. Our panel is number one. How you doing? Okay. Great. Next panelist. Good question. Good answer. Panelist number two. Yeah. Again. Controversial questions. I don't want to hear you screaming or Disagreements. Panelist number two. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> would you would you rather be mauled by a shark or die while skydiving? Why do we 
park in driveways, but drive on driveways. Well, do you do much driving? No, I, I've tried. I've tried getting my driver's license a lot of times, but for some reason I can't get it. So I'm going to ask Gary what he thinks. What do you say, Gary?
to be here. Uh, but I have to start out with a little bit of a confession that most of you know that uh, you can tell even just there. Mr. Thompson isn't really as nice to you as he should be. And um, I have a feeling he did this on purpose. Because the truth is, when he asked me a long time ago if I'd be interested in being involved in spiritual health this week and that you guys are going to be asking some of the tough questions and, and what I come in and talk about some of those. My first thought was, yeah, that would be cool. Um, but then I, I got the topic and um, this idea of confrontation or the idea of do I really need to mention your sin to you uh, is, is honestly um, probably the thing I want to talk about the least. Uh, most of you know me and you know that I, I, I'm really kind of a goofball. I like to goof around, I like to laugh, I like to have fun. And, 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 and that whole question of, of do I really need to talk to you about this, something you're doing wrong uh, is, is something that, that I wouldn't want to talk about at all. And so I want to start out just having you um, watch this video. So the first thing is a question of the right attitude. Do I have the right attitude to deal with this? And, and I had to read before we just started here, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, where Jesus is talking about this idea of, of talking to somebody else about what they've done wrong. And, and, and most of you know Jesus was a carpenter, so he used this carpenter's illustration. And on the one hand, he talked about a speck of sawdust. And he said, let's say you figure out somebody's got a speck of sawdust in their eye, but you've got a plank in your eye. And basically what he's saying in that is he's saying, look, before you get into this kind of thing, you've got to take care of your own stuff before you can help somebody else with their stuff. And I, I've got kind of my own illustration here. Then I, I want to make it worse than sawdust. I want to make it a toothpick so that you can see it. Let's say you find out that somebody else has a toothpick in their eye. I also kind of wanted to make it worse than sawdust because a toothpick in the eye would be a really bad thing. So let's say that you figure out that somebody else has a toothpick in their eye. In other words, this is your stuff, right, that I find out about. Now, on the other hand, this is my stuff that I got. And so I've got this in my eye. And I'm walking along and I find you and I see you and I see this toothpick in your eye. Well, dude, seriously, you got to take care of that. Because that's nasty up in your eye. Right? And that's the picture. 
picture that Jesus gives us. He gives us this picture of, yeah, you found something that's wrong in somebody else, but you got a whole lot of your own stuff too. And the first thing that I want you to see in this attitude that, that you have to have, you can't go to the person kind of all better than them, all superior to them. You've got to come to this point where you realize that we're all messed up. You're messed up, and I'm messed up, and Mr. Beefus is messed up, and as, as shocking as it may seem, Mr. Thompson is messed up. And if, if, if you really wrestle with this and, and, and you really start to wonder, is this something that I need to bring up? The first thing that you've got to make sure is you've got to make sure you're going to that person as a fellow struggler. You're going to that person as someone who you know you struggle and you know they struggle. And so as you come to them in this thing that's really uncomfortable, the first part of the attitude that you have to have is you have to go into the attitude and say, yeah, you're struggling. We've got this thing that we've got to talk about, but I know that I mess up too. I know that I'm a struggler too. And that whole thing that Jesus does, it's not so much the idea that your sin, whatever you have, is so much bigger than the, than the speck in their eye is. It's that your sin, in one way, your sin, the stuff that you wrestle with, should be way more important to you than the stuff that your friends wrestle with. You should be much more concerned about your faults, about the ways you mess up, than you are about the way your friends mess up. And so the first thing is this question of, do I have the right attitude? Now, the second thing that kind of flows out of that is the right approach. So let's say you know, again, you know about something, kind of taking that look inside, you think, you know, I, I, I do have to go to this person, how do I do it? How do I bring it up? And, and we could spend a, a whole talk on this. If, if we had a couple weeks in a row, I would want to do a whole other talk on this. But when Paul's writing to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he's talking about this stuff, and he says... When you go do this, do it gently. Go with gentleness. In other words, when, when you're going to somebody else about something that they're wrestling with or something that they've done wrong, you don't go in and say, oh, I know what you did, you messed up, you hurt me, and, and this whole kind of ah thing. You go in gently. And you say, you know what, honestly, I, I, I'd much rather not talk about this at all I'd much rather not bring it up. I wish we didn't have to be having this conversation. And, and, and maybe even start out saying, you know, I want you to know I mess up too. And I want you to know that I'm here to help. See, the gentleness that you have to have carries with it this idea that you're there to help this person. You're not, you're not there to condemn them. You're not there to make them feel bad. You're not there to get revenge on them. You're not there to take it out on them. You're not there to vent your anger on them. You're there to help. And in order to help somebody who's really struggling, you've got to go in gently. Now, you can probably see that because I'm sort of talking from the standpoint of you know what someone else did, but let's pretend it's something you did that somebody else finds out about. How do you want them to come to you? Do you want them to come to you and say, man, you just blew that. You hurt me, you hurt her, you're an awful person, I'm better than you. Or would you rather they came and they said, you know what, look, I don't want to have to do this. I don't want to have to talk to you about it. I'm no better than you. I make mistakes too. But seriously, we do need to talk about this. Most of us don't want the other person to bring it up at all. But if they are going to bring it up, we want it to be gentle, right? Because we're going to get into the goal of this in just a second. But if you're going to have any hope of this idea of restoration and your little meditation in there that Mr. Thompson wrote talks about the idea of wanting to restore things. If you're going to have any hope of restoring things, if you're going to have any hope of successfully talking to somebody else about something they struggle with, the best door in 
is the door of gentleness. And see, too often, the reason I want to talk about that is too often what we do is we don't go out of gentleness, we go out of anger. We go because they're mad about what they did. Maybe they hurt you directly, maybe they hurt your friend, maybe they cheated in class, they hurt your grade. Whatever it is, often when we go to somebody, we go because of anger. We go because we want to vent. We want to get them back. We want to correct them. We want to make them feel bad. We want to make ourselves feel better, whatever it is. And the simple fact is that it's not the goal. The goal in talking to somebody about something that they're, they're doing wrong or have done wrong isn't you at all. It's not about making you feel better. It's not about putting you in a better spot. It's not about making sure they get in trouble for what they did. It's about trying to help them. And that's why Paul in Galatians says that if you do this, do it gently. Now, I want to move into the third point because that kind of leads us to it. And this third point is the right goal. Because most of you, if you're at all like me, I, I have a feeling that, that here's what's going on in your head right now. You're thinking something along these lines. If you're thinking about this at all. Maybe you're thinking about lunch. Or... If you're thinking about this at all, you're probably thinking something along these lines. I don't want to do this in the first place. If I see somebody else who's messed up, I want to eat the Doritos. I don't want to talk to them. It's uncomfortable. It's not nice. They might reject me. I don't want to do it in the first place. And then Phil gets up here, and not only is it something I don't want to do, Phil starts talking about how I need to check my own attitude, and how I need to be careful in how I approach him, and all that stuff. And if you're at all like me, you're probably sitting there thinking something like, you know what? I'm just not going to do it. I'm not, if I see something happen, I see somebody do something, I'm just, I'm just going to stay out of it. I'm going to sit at the table, eat the bag of Doritos, and one of my friends will handle it, or Mr. Thompson will handle it, Mr. Beavis will handle it, somebody will handle it, but I'm going to stay out of it. And the problem with that is that God really makes this a, a, a pretty big deal. That God talks a lot in his word about doing this, about going to each other, about being willing to confront each other, about being willing to, to, to gently say to somebody, you know, this is something in your life you really need to look at. And the question that I want to leave you with here to wrap this up, like I said, we're going to take most of the time on this, this lot, is... Why would you do this? Why would you go to somebody? We, I, 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 I could ask you, and you could list really quickly for me the reasons not to. And the reasons not to are it's uncomfortable, you feel like it's not your place, you know you're no better than them, you know if you go to them, it might damage your friendship. And so we could list tons of reasons of why not to do it, I want you to ask the reason, ask the question for just a couple minutes, why? Why would I go to them? And I actually, I actually want you to watch another video. And it's a video that, if, if I don't describe it to you, it's going to feel like it doesn't fit here. It's a video from the Navy. And I want to warn you up front, a little bit of it feels like maybe it's a, it's a commercial for the Navy. And I don't mind giving a commercial for the Navy, because the Navy's awesome. I don't mind giving a commercial for the Navy, but it's not really our point here today. It's about Navy rescue. And what I want you to do is I want you to watch this, and I want you to hear these guys talk about how they put in a ton of work. They work really, really hard. They put themselves in really, really dangerous situations. And as you watch this, it's about four minutes long. I want you to watch this, and I want you to listen for why do they do that. Why do they work so hard? Why do they put themselves in those dangerous spots? And so, watch this, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. I'm 
AWS One and your worth. I'm a first class today, officer in the United States Navy. Chief Naval Air Crewman Jeremiah Wilkins, United States Navy. My name is Solomon Padilla. I'm an AWS Two. I'm a rescue swimmer in the United States Navy. Uh, Aaron Christie, United States Navy. A graduate of rescue swimmers for awards, hands down. Um, the best day of my entire life. SAR stands for Search and Rescue. You have to find what it is you want to do and, and go get it. There's probably not a better feeling at the end of the day you knowing that you can go out and save someone's life one day. Our training is extremely tough to become a rescue swimmer. We swim every day, run every day, push ups, sit ups, pull ups, and you just gotta want it. They put so much time into you and they make sure you're the right guy for the job. They are not gonna see you out there if you're not. We train at night, during the day, and we train at the hardest level possible that way. When the rescues come, we're not throwing a curveball. We are fully prepared to execute our mission to the highest level possible. It's given me everything. It's, I'm about to get my bachelor's degree here in my last two classes as we speak, and the Navy has paid for every bit of it. It's been really easy getting that, that school now. It, it's easy when you have the money available to you because the Navy just pays for it. I don't have to ever worry about that side of it. The Navy has completely prepared me for civilian life as far as technical training, uh, job skills, life skills, confidence, self-reliance, and, and self-responsibility. I know I'm going to have a paycheck consistently, and that, that makes my family happy, that makes my wife happy, that makes them feel secure, especially in times like this. I was at Hurricane Katrina, help rescue a medevac, hundreds of people. Sad to see people stranded uh, without houses uh, on top of rooftops, but it was a great thing saving them, uh, rescuing them, uh, getting hoisted, and uh, taking them and their loved ones to safety. Basically, you're putting yourself in a situation of, of great risk for the purposes of saving somebody else, and that's kind of what we're all about. You do what you can at, at whatever risk to get them to safety. I feel like I make a difference every day I, I show up, whether it be here at Rescue Swimmer School or back in the fleet flying uh, missions in support of whether it be Iraqi Freedom in Afghanistan or just everyday missions off the coast. I am absolutely making a difference. I'm making a difference to this country. I'm making a difference for this community. I'm making a difference for my brother. It makes me feel amazing to rescue somebody, to know that they were, you know, on that mountainside or, or stuck in the water and they needed me and I could come in there and I, I could do everything I needed to do to get them out of there. I think that my proudest day would probably have to be the day that I pulled that guy out of the water. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that he gets it back and if that means me sacrificing myself to make sure that he gets home safely with his family, but I'm willing to do that. It makes me feel awesome. It's, it's an amazing feeling to know that uh, I'm put there to make sure I can live. That's my role. When I go to work, I take it very seriously, and uh, I'm ready to make sure that I'm there so other people can live. Honestly, for me, I wake up every day thinking, I got the best job in the Navy right now. As I was rustling through what to say to you guys today, the thing that really bothered me was, how do I talk to you about why to do because, you know, you guys are smart and you're in Christian school and, and you know you're messed up. You know you sin. You know you blow it. I don't need to point that out to you. You know you do that stuff and you know you're really no better than anybody else. You also know, and you may not do it, but you know deep down in your mind if you're going to talk to somebody else about a problem, you know how to do that. You know how to be gentle because you know how some, you would want someone to talk to you. You guys know that stuff. And yet the reality is for most of us, whether you guys are here in Christian school or you're in the church I serve or wherever, the reality for most of us is we don't go to other people 
when we know they're messed up in a sin. We don't do it. And what I really battled with was how do I talk to you about why to do it? And it kept coming back to my mind over and over and over again that I wanted to use warriors. And the reason I wanted to use warriors is not just because it's cool photography and cool equipment and all that stuff. The reason I wanted to use it is because the simple fact that God lays out is that we are in a war together. Now our lives don't really look like it necessarily. It's a different kind of war, but the Bible makes it really plain that you and I, as followers of Christ, are involved in a war. And when Paul's talking to Timothy, this young guy that Paul sort of was Paul's protege, and Paul's trying to help him along and help him understand what life with God is like and what's important. At one point he talks to Timothy, it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he talks to Timothy about confronting people who are doing things that are wrong. And Paul says, when you do that, and when the person turns away from what they're doing wrong, he says, you have helped save them from the snare or the trap of Satan. And the thing that I, I, I want to end with here is this idea that when you know somebody else is doing something wrong, it's not just about them being wrong. It's not just about them hurting you or them hurting your friend. It's not even just as important as this about them committing a sin. They're in the trap of Satan as they do that. And the reality is that God wants us to bring it up, not just because it's wrong, or not just because they've hurt people, not just because of that. All that's really important, but that's not all it is. If you follow through biblically, carefully, what God says, He says, I want you to bring it up to them because they're in a really dangerous place. Those, those, those people who go in the Navy rescue, they go into it, they say, because I know that person is in a dangerous place. And I will put myself in a dangerous place to help them. And when you go to somebody, honestly, you're putting yourself in a dangerous place because they might get mad at you. It might break the friendship down. They might reject you. All that stuff. Is it dangerous to go to somebody like this? Yeah, it is. Just like it's dangerous for those guys to dive in the water or rappel down the cliff or whatever. They're putting themselves in a dangerous spot to save the other person. And you know, I was sitting in this coffee shop and I was wondering, how do I talk to you guys about this? And, and what went through my mind is I really wish that you could spend about two weeks with me. And I wish that you could sit with me in some of the confidential appointments that I have. And I wish that you could listen to people talk about living out the consequences of the sins that they've committed. A couple weeks ago, not from here, but I wish you could have sat with me as I talked with this senior who's been kicked out of school again for cheating. And he's just been let know by a bunch of colleges it's not going to happen because of that. And he's trying to figure out, what do I do now? Or, or I wish you could have sat with me with this, as, I, as I spoke with this woman about her young kids and, and as she talked about years ago. She knew this guy she married wasn't a believer, but she loved him so much. And she thought, yeah, he's not a believer, but I love him, and, and I know if I marry him, he'll come around. And she sat there just weeping because he never did, and she's sitting there now wondering, how do I introduce my kids to Christ when he's opposed to it? Or I wish you could have sat with me about a month ago with a 14-year-old girl who was pregnant. It was just sex. Everybody's doing it. It was even protected. And now she's sitting there wondering, what do I do with my life? How do I do this? And she knows one way or another, whatever decision she makes now, that it's changed the whole thing. And she's trying to figure out, what do I do? Or I also wish about four years ago, you could have sat with me and a really good friend of mine. 
who was 35 years old. It's about a month and a half before he killed himself because he's an alcoholic and he lost everything. Lost his job, lost his family. And we sat there, you know, we traced it back and we said, you know what, I remember the party in high school where it started. And he said, I wish somebody would have just said something to me that. And about a month and a half later, he killed himself. That's the war you're in. That's the war your friends are in. See, this isn't just little tiny stuff we pick to do wrong every now and then. This is stuff that's a really, really big deal. Because it's happening in a whole different realm. There's a whole different world going on that we don't see. And what Paul says to Timothy, he says, look, there's an enemy there whose every bit is alive, every bit is real, and every bit is active as you are. And he's got one goal, and his goal is just to mess you up. And he's got all kinds of tools to do. And if we take the Bible seriously, every temptation that faces you is this little trap that he's set for you. But this talk isn't about you. This talk is about that person sitting next to you. Because every temptation they face is a little trap that he set for them. And I guarantee you that every one of those four people that I listed, because every single one of the four of them said this, said, why didn't somebody talk to me? Why didn't somebody come to me and say, stop, I love you. I don't want you on this road. I'm no better than you. I mess up too. But stop now. Get out of the snare now. Because see, the wildness, it's not about this just big idea that sin is wrong. Yeah, it is. It's not even just about this big idea that God is holy. Yeah, it is. But if we take what God says about this, about those times you know something, and you're wondering, do I go and talk about this? Do I not go and talk about this? God's asking you, Will you be a rescue swimmer? Will you go and will you rescue this person who's in a really, really dangerous spot? The name of that video that the Navy put out is called So Others May Live. And the idea is they put themselves in a really dangerous, really uncomfortable spot so that other people will live. And I really believe as we close this, and I want to pray, as we close this, I think that's what God is asking you today. Is He's asking you, will you put yourself in a really uncomfortable, really dangerous spot? Will you risk looking dumb and holier than now? Will you risk the relationship? Will you risk looking like a good and two shoes? But do it so that others may let it. Let's pray. God, we are really tempted to just mess around with sin. Lord, we're really tempted to just look at it through little things that we do wrong. And because of that, Lord, we don't want to talk to each other about this. God, I've been through this a hundred times, and I still don't want to talk about it. I'd still rather eat the Doritos. But, Lord, this is a big deal. We are in a war. And I pray as we close this off, as we go from here, Lord, I pray that maybe it'll just give us a little different perspective on why we should talk to someone else. Lord, I pray that we're going to make ourselves feel better and make them feel bad and get mad back at them or anything like that. Lord, I pray that you'll stop us from going. But God, if we can see ourselves as a rescue swimmer, if we can see ourselves as someone that's willing to put ourselves in a little danger, so that someone else can live. Then give us the courage to go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Phil. That was a powerful message, wasn't it? I remember two or three years ago, I was talking with a friend of mine from high school. And we talked about another friend, a mutual friend we both had, who has just 
ruins life, is what the short way to say it. And, uh, I wish I had said something back then. I wish we had, I wish we had just, he was a, this kid was a popular kid and everyone liked him. Nobody said anything. We saw then he was heading off into a long course, just uh, flagrantly disobedient and unsubmissive and just rebellious. But it was just kind of cool. And we look back at that, I just wish we could have said something. I wish he wouldn't have been popular. I wish he would have been a message that's not the right thing to do. And I look here at, at our school, you know, we've had some kids come and some kids go. At a Christian school, we kind of hope that while they're here, somebody says something to them. Somebody gives them the idea that, man, you're, you're, you're going off. And kind of, just, like, just like Phil said, you're kind of rescue them. That's, it literally is a matter of life and death. So, thank you, Phil. That was a good, uh, just a good, powerful message. Uh, a good start to our spiritual emphasis week. This is one of the questions that you guys have asked. How do we talk to people about this? We know that there are people who, even in our, in our school community, there are people who are not doing this right. How do we approach this? Well, I think you got a good, a good lesson on how to do that today. And a real reminder of why it's so important to do that. Um, you're going to be heading off to small groups. Um, seniors and uh, small group leaders, make sure to give me your sheets after orders and programs. Still, you are dismissed. Go ahead and uh, put your cares away and head for an office.